Well, good evening, friends. I do apologise for... Uh, it's a very late recording, this one. I did actually do a recording earlier on. I've had an irritation on my left side here all day. And uh, it's, it's sort of put me off doing one a little bit. But um, I do want to do a very short uh, vlog, if you like, more than anything, about what church is going to look like in a post-COVID-19 world if this is post covid 19 who knows what's going on it's absolutely crazy if you want to turn to the book of genesis very quickly i'm not going to spend much time but um i just want to um use genesis chapter 8 as a little bit of a framework to um hopefully how we can help to see some of the positives that can come out of this time frame that we're in. Um, I've been a Christian now for 28 years. In the 28 years that I've been saved, I've never had any time off church. I've never sort of thought at any time, you know, I'm not going to church for a month or two months or anything. So this whole period for me, I've found to be extreme. Uh, on, on one side, it's been a real blessing, don't get me wrong. On another side, it's been extremely strange, extremely strange not to be in church, not to be with the people of God. And um, I said at the beginning of this, you know, it, it takes 21 days to form a habit. And, you know, we are kind of over, what is it, over three months into this now. And it's, it, it, really does feel strange. Now, just to let you know, I'm meeting uh, with the elders on Tuesday and I really would ask you all in the church and anybody that wants to, please, uh, to really pray um, for when we get back together because it seems like there is an awful lot of restrictions being put on the church and we'll go through these. I'll, I'll put a video up on, on Wednesday to talk about these restrictions. Like I say, I'm meeting with um, Phil and Ray. They're older than me. They're wiser than me. And the three of us are going to be praying together and looking at the, all the things that we're going to do. And we'll, we'll have to come up with some kind of a... Uh, a way forwards which is the best way forwards for our church but it's very strange I mean the idea that I've, I've, I've checked with quite a few pastors uh, some of which uh, are hearing this from the very very top that it does seem that we're not going to be allowed at this moment in time to sing um, and you know it's just very, it's just bizarre. There's something extremely bizarre about this whole thing. You know, on the one hand, people are meeting together on beaches, rioting in streets, uh, you know, just even the guys that, you know, celebrating the, the, the Liverpool victory the other day, people meeting together everywhere. Um, but it seems at this moment in time that they're basically saying that churches, <laughs> churches can't sing. Now, um, like I say, I've never had any time off church. And this is way before I was a pastor. I, I've never, you know, even when church was pretty boring, uh, I enjoyed going. Even when prayer meetings were boring, I still enjoyed going. I've, I've, I've gone from being a mild druggie and, you know, somebody that was out of control on drink and, and stuff to somebody that spent the last 28 years in church. And it is just bizarre that they're kind of now saying that when we go back, there's, there's a whole list of things that we are going to have to do. And, and if we don't do them right, we're going to be in trouble. So, you know, to some degree, we have to abide by, by these rules. Um, very strange. I want to try and encourage you because in the face of this 
kind of impossible situation which every church is finding itself in at the moment. I mean, the, the, the idea of people worshipping with masks on, to me, is just off the scale. Um, but in the midst of all this chaos that we've got at the moment about what it's going to look like going back, I want to just look very, very briefly at Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8. So, in Genesis chapter 8, God says, um, Then God remembered Noah and every living thing. God remembered Noah and every living thing. You know the situation with the flood. God flooded the earth because wickedness had reached an all-time high. He flooded the earth, but before he flooded the earth, he told Noah to make a, a, a huge ocean-going liner that's only job was to stay afloat. And the Lord brought the animals to Noah. Noah means rest. That's what the word, no, the name Noah means. They came to him. Remember, Jesus said, come to me, or you were weak and heavy laden. The animals came to Noah. They entered into the ark. Noah entered into the ark. God said, come into the ark he was already in there he's telling them to come in the door was shut and the rains came down for 40 days and 40 nights the reason why i want to look at genesis 8 there was a pastor in um, congleton the town that i live in that discussed genesis 8 a few weeks ago and I, I it just rung a bell with me the reason why we're looking at genesis 8 is because they were locked away they were in a kind of an isolation thing during a, 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 a global pandemic if you like a global event but when it came to being released back out it kind of happened in stages and I do think that's how it's going to happen ultimately it, um, it's going to happen in stages this is, we're not going to get, get back to the normal way of of church and and you know post COVID-19 what on earth does that even look like friends I, I really don't know but know this God remembers you you know, if you've been tucked away in a house for goodness knows how long, God remembers you and he remembers the plans that he has for his church. We are his body. We don't function individually. We function as a body. We come together as a body. We function as a body. You know, people have said during COVID-19, you know, the church isn't a building. You're right, the church isn't a building. But we are to come together in one accord, you know, Acts chapter 2, Psalm 133. What does it t say about the brothers dwelling together in unity? We are to come together, whether it be in a building or whether it be in a hay barn. You know, we are to come together and to be together. So God remembered Noah. Hallelujah. And God remembers us. And it tells us that he sent a great wind to pass over the, the seas, the waters. And... Um, you know, the, the word wind, you all know the word wind is ruach. And if ever the church needed God's holy wind to blow, friends, it's now. There's, I don't think there's ever been a time in the 28 years that I've been a Christian where we, we need God's Holy Spirit to blow like never before. We really do. And um, we need... God to show us the way because we are lying if we say that we know the way in this. We're, we're lying to one another. We are utterly reliant upon God as to what is the way forward from here on in post COVID-19. So if you go down to verse 4, Genesis chapter 8 verse 4, there is a very interesting verse there. It says that the ark rested on the, on the seventh month of the 17th day and without going into a whole load of details that is the day that Jesus rose again from the grave he was crucified on the 14th of Nisan he rose from the grave on the 17th of Nisan this is the very day that Jesus Christ rose from the grave now there's something important in this because I think I think things are going to get difficult. <laughs> they're going to get difficult. And in some ways, they're being made difficult for us. We need to keep our eye on the finished work of the cross. We need to, we need to rest on, on Christ's resurrection. The ark rested on the day that Christ was raised from the grave. And by the way, that was a Sunday. 
That was the first day of the week. The church was born on a Sunday, the first day of the week. It wasn't called Sunday then, it was called the first day of the week, whatever. It was the first day of the week, Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, the fire of God fell and the ark rested on the first day of the week. It rested on the 17th of Nisan. And it's so important that we keep in mind that even when it seems like we are failing, when it seems like the, even the, the, the you know, what does it say about Smyrna? What does it say about Philadelphia? These are God's two gr great churches, really. Both of them are weak. Both of them are weak. And we, it may well appear at the moment that the church looks very weak and almost pathetic, you know, going back and not being able to sing and all these things. But bear in mind, never lose sight of the finished work, hallelujah, of the cross and of Christ's resurrection, that death could not hold him. He rose from the, de from the dead, hallelujah. And his resurrection is our resurrection. And his justification is our justification. We, are, we have been justified by faith because that man was absolutely sinless. Therefore, death could not hold him and Satan had no hold on Jesus Christ. God rose him from the grave. This is important for us today because we need rest. I really believe that. We're living in days when we need rest. You know, in Leviticus chapter 26, it's it, even in the midst of all those judgments, which it talks about in Leviticus 26, it says that when I send you to Babylon, my land, he says, my land will have her Sabbath rests, will have a Sabbath rest. And I do believe that in this time, to some, in, in some way, it's like God has given us all the sabbatical. Um, it felt so strange at the beginning. It was alarming. Let's be honest, at the beginning it was. And slowly, you know, you begin to think, well, wait a minute, God is doing something here. He's given us a sabbatical. He, he's, he's saying, come aside and rest for a while. And I've enjoyed it in that way. I haven't enjoyed what's been going on. I've certainly not enjoyed the fact that many, many people have died during this time. But there has been something in this where the Lord has said, come aside, come to me, all you are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And what does it say here? The ark rested on the 17th of Nisan. That's basically what it's saying without going into too much details. That is what it's saying. There is rest even in calamity. There's rest even in chaos. And as we look around, and I've tried to, <laughs> I've been talking to, you know, uh, some of my friends, asking them about what they think the way forward is. And folks, this is just unprecedented. It's just bizarre. But in it, we can rest. We can rest in Christ that nothing that's coming our way uh, will we'll ever take our Lord by surprise. It might take us by surprise. It won't take him by surprise. And then what you see is when the ark rests, they don't just get out, you see. That's the whole point of looking at Genesis 8. They don't just get out and say, right, guys, because the waters have really got to decrease. They've got to come off the mountains. And so we read, we read in uh, verse 5 that the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. And in the 10th month on the first day uh, of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. That must have been awesome. I mean, I cannot even imagine what that must have looked like when you began to see the very tops of the mountains. And Noah would have had some kind of an idea what those mountains were but he would have seen them from sea level, as was sea level. The, the ark is somewhere around 15 to 17,000 feet now above sea level, and the waters are starting to go down, and the mountains are starting to go higher again. Unbelievable, unbelievable. But of course, they couldn't just jump off. And the idea of just rushing back to church at this time... Um, we had a friend of ours come round the other day, he's a nurse, and he has lost 
some of his friends, nurses. He's lost some of his doctor friends in this time. This thing is real, folks. If you don't think it's real, it's real. Uh, there is a church in Germany that tried to go back early. Over 100 people contracted COVID-19. Now, you might not care too much about it, you know, about whether you live or die. The longer things go on here, honestly, I, I, I'm sure, I know, I know that many of you think the same way. I, I'm just thinking Maranatha, you know, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus. Even so, come Lord Jesus, because quite frankly, some of the stuff that's going on at the moment is off the scale. And yet we haven't even started yet. The waters have to subside. We have to wait, friends. We have to wait. Now, what Noah does is, first of all, he sends out a raven, as you know. The raven goes to and fro on the earth. The raven doesn't come back, probably feeding off corpses, because that's what ravens do. But he sends out a dove, and the dove finds no rest, place of rest. Though all the time, the waters are going down. You know, you look at this R number at the moment, and this R number should be going down. It sounds to me as though it's beginning to spike again, but... You know, it should be going down and down and down. Um, if, we, if you continue to see all this looting and rioting and all these people on the beaches, then it's, it's going to go up again, obviously. Um, but in the same way that the waters are going down, Noah does not get out of that ark until the Lord tells him to. That's, that's the main emphasis of what we see here. Uh, even the so eventually it says, and he waited yet another seven days, and again he sent the dove out from the ark. The dove came to him in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth, and no one knew that the waters had receded from the earth. So by this time, no one knows. You know, there's life out there, there's trees growing, things are happening, but he still doesn't get out. He's waiting for the Lord to speak. Listen, friends, um, I, you know, if, if you've got all the answers to this situation, please get in touch with me because I haven't. <laughs> and, and I look at this and think, Lord, we are heavily reliant on you at this moment in time to speak to us and show us the way here. We need to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit in this. So Noah didn't do anything. He stayed in the ark and they waited another seven days, sent out the dove, which did not return. So the third time the dove didn't return. And it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month of the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked. And indeed, the surface of the ground was dry. That must have been quite some day they've been stuck in this boat now for over a year over a year in pretty primitive conditions and it says in verse 14 that in the second month on the 27th day of the month the earth was dried then God spoke to Noah saying go out of the ark you and your wife your sons and your sons wives uh, and, and that was the command. He waited. He waited. And I do believe that that's what we should be doing. We should, we should be waiting on the Lord. And when we meet on Tuesday, that's what we need to be doing is praying and waiting on the Lord and asking the Lord and, and not running ahead of him. But not lagging behind him either. You know, it's really important that we, we walk with the Lord into this uh, new world really that we're, we're going into now there is a command that um, God gives Noah a command and the command is to be fruitful and fill the earth and <laughs> don't think for one minute that the restrictions which the government or any organization put on the church will stop the church from being fruitful. The church will be fruitful. You know, at the end of the book of Acts, when um, Paul is in chains, it says that the gospel still went forth unhindered. 
So even with the restrictions that the government and, uh, is putting on things at this moment in time, it does not stop the gospel from going forth. Nothing will stop the gospel from going forth. The light will continue to shine in the darkness. And we are to work while there's light because the hour is coming when no one will be able to work. Now let's get to the thing that Noah does, which I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about. So it says in verse 20, then Noah built an altar to the Lord. He built an altar to the Lord. This wasn't a command from God. We don't see God saying, I want you to build an altar to me or anything like that. This is something that Noah genuinely wanted to do. Now, everybody misses something about church. Personally for me, and everybody's different, but personally for me, what I miss more than anything else about meeting together, I meet, uh, sorry, I miss worshipping God together. I miss that so much. I can't tell you the amount of times when we've been in church worshipping the Lord together, when I have just felt this is my home. This is my family. And the, the most wonderful times I've ever had in church has been when we've been worshipping the Lord together. And I want you to take heart because whatever restrictions are placed upon the church for, for, for a time, it will in no way stop the church from worshipping him in spirit and in truth, no way. <coughs> We're going to build an altar to the Lord. We're going to worship him, friends. There are many ways to worship the Lord. Some of you will remember Mick a few years ago coming to the front of the church going down on his knees and just lifting his hands up in the air and saying, Lord, I worship you. I worship you. It was a few years ago now. Things weren't going very well in the church at the time. And I just remember Mick coming forward, going down on his knees and saying, Lord, I worship you. Our church has always been a worshipping church. We've always been a worshipping people. We always have been. And we will continue to be a worshipping people at this time. If the restrictions are put on us that we can't sing, listen, friends, there are many ways to worship our God and our King and our Saviour. But we're not coming out of this lockdown without building an altar and worshipping our Lord. Thank God. Thank God. This whole chapter you know, he rested on the day that Jesus rose from the grave. What does the altar speak of? It speaks of the finished work of Christ. Hallelujah. We're going to worship him, friends, and nothing is going to stop us. Now, let me just read to you from a psalm that I have been reading all the way through this lockdown. And it just reminds me of church. Just reminds me of church. Many times at four o'clock in the morning, I've read this psalm to myself, mostly because I couldn't get to sleep. But I've just found so much uh, strength from it. But more than that, I've sensed the glory of God when I've read it. I'm just going to read it to you. It's Psalm 84. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, 
Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Selah. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. O God, behold our shield. Look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Yes, friends. No restrictions are ever going to stop the church from longing for the courts of the Lord, from coming into his presence together, from the Holy Spirit resting on the body corporately as we worship him in spirit and in truth. Maybe during the, the first few weeks, maybe we're going to find out what worship really is. None of us fully know how to worship the Lord. I certainly, I'm no expert, but I'm willing to learn and I want to know what, what the Lord requires at this time. Now it's very true that during this time there will be, not just in the world, but maybe even within church, there may be those that just want to carry on building a tower. In Genesis 11, they refused to be fruitful and propagate the gospel. They said, we're staying here. Let us make a name for ourselves." Remember? And God comes along and he stops them. I don't know whether the world has learned from this I don't even know whether the church has learned from this. Is That's my, I don't know. We have to learn from this and we have to find out what we were doing wrong and begin to worship him in ways maybe that we've never done before. But it doesn't stop there with the Tower of Babel. In Genesis chapter 12, it says this. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, or Abram, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There was a man, he wasn't a Jew. He was just like anybody else. And for, for reasons that we don't fully understand, God called this man out of Mesopotamia, away from Babylon, away from the Tower of Babel. These people at the Tower of Babel were saying, let us make a name for ourselves. God said to Abraham, you follow me, Abraham. You follow me by faith, Abraham. You, I will make you into a nation that blesses the earth. Follow me, he says, and I will make your name great. Yeah, the, it doesn't stop, friends, at the Tower of Babel. It goes on and God calls a man and God is calling you at this time. He's calling me at this time. Like Abraham, we don't know what's coming ahead. We, we're going out not knowing what's coming ahead. No one fully knows what's coming ahead. But listen, God loves you. God has called you. The one that began that good work in your life is the same one that's going to see it through. Let's express ourselves maybe in ways that we've never done before. Let's thank God for getting us through this pandemic together. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. I know people, good people, that didn't make it through. But I know where they are. I know where they are right now. But you and I, for, we are still here for this time. We are to work while there's light. For the, for the hour comes when no one can work. People may continue to build towers. People may continue to try and make names for themselves. But God is calling. He's calling people out of Mesopotamia. He's calling people out of Babylon. He's calling people to follow him. None of us fully know how this is going to pan out. Nobody does. But we trust him, don't we? The just shall live by faith. We trust him that the one that's brought us through this, he will show us the next season. On last Wednesday, young Alex uh, did a message on seasons. We are about to go into a new season and it's time when we get back together to build an altar to the Lord, to let, lift up our hands, holy hands in the air and thank him for everything that he's done, to get down on our knees. You know, we've just had this whole thing where people are getting down on a knee what about the church finally getting down on a knees, lifting her hands up in the air and saying, thus far, the Lord has been good to us. Amen.